Our sun traces a dependable path across our skies every day, yet only very recently have we discovered that it has its share of stormy days. For the last three centuries, solar activity levels have come and gone in a roughly 11-year cycle that we have actually grown to expect. Even our biosphere shows the unmistakable traces of these cycles, resonating in everything from the carbon-14 abundances in tree rings to global precipitation patterns and coral layering. Our eyes never see the sun brighten or dim, nor are we even remotely aware that the sun cycles back and forth from stormy to quiescent, but the sun has a big effect on the hidden aspects of our environment. Somewhere in the dark space between the solar photosphere and our Earth lies the secret of our Sun-Earth connection. The sun is the source of most of the energy on Earth, the power source for plants, the weather we experience each day, the source of warmth that makes life possible. None would exist without it. Hello, I'm Stan Odenwald, a professional astronomer at Catholic University. My research has taken me to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland to investigate space weather issues. During this series of podcasts, I will be your guide to understanding the forces that work within the sun, how those forces affect life on Earth, and the many exciting components to the sun-Earth connection. The study of the sun is one of the most fascinating subjects in science. Even though the sun is 93 million miles away, the power of the sun affects us in ways much more complicated than just the warmth on our faces. Just ask the sailors who were in a ship much like this back in the 1800s. September 2nd, 1859 was a day of hell for the clipper ship Southern Cross. The seas were rough that day off the coast of Chile. Hailstorms and high waves mercilessly fought the crew as they tried to save their ship. Most of the crew had been through storms like this before, but at 1.30 a.m., the crew saw a sight the likes of which struck terror into their souls. It was as if the sea and sky became an ocean boiling in blood. The clouds glowed red, which the rough seas reflected. Meanwhile, the Aurora Australis was alive with unusual activity. Its light was so strong that it pierced the storm clouds. Then, there was another spectacular sight. As the storm waned, the crew saw crimson lights on the horizon, as if a powerful armada was in battle. Ghostly curtains of light snaked across the sky like some alien searchlights from deep space. The ship's compass refused to point in any direction. Many sailors thought that the end of the world had come. When the ship finally berthed in San Francisco, the crew discovered that the drama had not been confined to Chile or even the Southern Hemisphere. Two-thirds of Earth's skies were also covered by the same event. Telegraph systems worldwide went haywire. Spark discharges shocked telegraph operators and set telegraph paper on fire. Even when telegraphers disconnected batteries powering the lines, aurora-induced electric currents in the ground still allowed messages to be transmitted. It was as if today's internet had been wiped out. What happened? On the day before the event, the English astronomer Richard Carrington witnessed an unusual solar flare on the surface of the sun. Carrington was studying sunspots, the one he witnessed that day was huge, almost 10 times the diameter of the Earth. Suddenly, two beads of searing white light erupted over the sunspots during a five-minute period. No one had ever seen the sun behave that way before. What Carrington saw was a solar flare, a magnetic explosion on the sun. Solar flares happen most frequently around the time of sunspot maximum. 
A single large solar flare can provide the energy needs for the entire world for over 10,000 years. The largest solar flare explosions usually eject huge clouds of electrically charged particles into space, called coronal mass ejections. When the CMEs strike Earth's magnetic field, they set in motion a series of domino falls that quickly produce the aurora in the atmosphere. They also cause technology to malfunction. We astronomers call the sun stormy condition space weather, and we know it has been a problem for us for over 150 years. The historical record of these storms tells us a dramatic story. In 1921, a fire burned down the central New England Railroad Station in Brewster, New York. In 1946, a passenger airplane crashed in Gander, Newfoundland, killing 18 people on board. Solar interference in 1956 caused a major surge for the Acheron submarine, whose radio signal suddenly stopped. And in 1972, a huge solar flare knocked out long-distance telephone communication all across Illinois. A massive CME on March 13, 1989, provoked geomagnetic storms that disrupted electric power transmission from the Hydro-Quebec generating station in Canada, blacking out most of the province and plunging six million people into darkness for nine hours. Aurora-induced power surges even affected power transformers as far away as New Jersey. In December 2005, X-rays from another major solar storm disrupted the global positioning satellite system for over 10 minutes. As Bell Laboratory scientist Lou Lanzarotti noted, I would not want to be on a commercial airliner at that time, being guided in for landing by the GPS. Throughout the last 500 years, the scale of the solar storm of 1859 has never been equaled. Even the most spectacular recent storms are less than half as intense. With our current reliance on computer technology, another Carrington event could cost us billions of dollars. For example, it is expected from recent historical events that cell phone and satellite communications, along with GPS receivers, will be disrupted. Research by space weather scientists estimate that the potential damage to the hundreds of satellites currently in orbit around Earth could cost between 30 and 70 billion dollars. Humans in space would also be in harm's way. Spacewalking astronauts might have only minutes after the first flash of light to find shelter from the energetic solar particles following close on the heels of those initial photons. Hours later, high-energy protons from the coronal mass ejections would arrive and disrupt satellites. During a superstorm, and behind only a few centimeters of aluminum, which is the shielding found in the average spacecraft, astronauts would still suffer a dose that could cause radiation sickness. If outside in a spacesuit during a spacewalk, the radiation might even be life-threatening. It is no wonder that NASA and other institutions around the world have made the study and prediction of solar flares an urgent priority. Right now, a fleet of spacecraft is monitoring the sun, gathering data on flares big and small that may eventually reveal what triggers the explosions. Satellites such as ACE, Hanodi, SOHO, STEREO, and others are already in orbit while new spacecraft are being readied for launch. We know that research won't prevent a Carrington flare, but it may help us avoid the panic of surprise by letting us predict the impacts of the next solar flare. I'm Stan Odenwald.